All right, let's rock and roll. Chapter 20 in Rubin and Babby's Research Methods for Social Work, Qualitative Data Analysis. In our discussion in this podcast, we will be introducing you to the process of qualitative data analysis. The importance of linking theory with analysis and some specific doing the process of qualitative data analysis. And finally, an overview of some computer programs for doing qualitative data analysis. Unlike its quantitative partner, qualitative analysis relies on rules and practices that are not so hard and fast. While qualitative analysis is the non-numerical analysis of observations, there are times when we do put numbers to our qualitative analysis. But its primary purpose is to discover meanings and patterns that underlie the observations we make during our research. While much of qualitative data analysis is the analysis of textual data, we can analyze anything that we observe. And while we cannot necessarily make causal assertions, as we might in some quantitative research methods, we can articulate possible links by examining either changes over time or the co-occurrence of certain variables with one another. As with all research, we need to be ever cognizant that our theories that drive our investigations are constantly involved with our data collection, analysis, and report writing. <clears throat> Slide four. Oftentimes I get students in this class who asked me about theories. We use the word theory in a lot of different ways in the social sciences. There are the theories of human behavior that you are all learning about in HIPSI or you learned about last year. We're not necessarily talking about those kinds of theory, although those theories about human behavior can help inform how we define our theories. Essentially, a theory in qualitative research is our articulation of a plausible relationship between concepts and sets of concepts. Sometimes, in qualitative analysis, we work at a simple conceptual level and explore the relationship between simple concepts. Other times we discover clusters or sets of concepts that are related and we explore those clusters of concepts and how they interact and or related to uh, other concepts and clusters of concepts. <clears throat> As you can see, doing qualitative analysis even before actually doing it, it starts to get pretty complicated. You're going to be so relieved next semester when we get into simple stuff like statistical analysis. Slide five. At its most base level, qualitative analysis is looking for and discovering patterns in our data. Patterns can be a variety of things. How frequently does a phenomenon occur within the topic of study? How strong is it? What is its magnitude? What are the structures that exist within the pattern of our phenomenons? We look for processes, look for repeating patterns of behavior. And then we look at those processes, <clears throat> we look for things that preceded them. What was the cause of that pattern of behavior? And finally, we look at the consequences of those patterns of behavior. Essentially, what happens after the thing that we saw in our data analysis? So looking at those six items I just spoke of, one, frequencies, two, magnitudes, three, structures, four, processes, five, causes, six, <clears throat> and the consequences and compare those to the three bulleted items in slide five, 
maybe we can understand how each of those fits in during the course of a qualitative analysis. When we are using variable-oriented analysis and focus on the interrelations of just a few variables, we may be looking at frequencies, magnitudes, structures, processes, causes, and consequences. Case-oriented analysis, again, depending on the case, we may be looking at all those patterns. And a cross-case analysis is simply an analysis of the case-oriented study that involves multiple cases. Slide six. I am sure you are tired of hearing me rattle on. about grounded theory method. So take a deep breath, let out a sigh, and say, oh, here he goes again. But I would hope that as a budding social work practitioner, you're, you would take a deep appreciation of grounded theory. Grounded theory is an inductive analysis. What that means is that theory is built from the observations up, not the other way around, as in the case of most qualitative analysis and virtually all quantitative analysis. At its heart, the grounded theory method relies on something called constant comparison. As we examine cases in grounded theory, we begin to develop concepts about the data we are analyzing. When we begin to build up a number of concepts and we have looked at a number of cases, we can start to compare those <clears throat> across these cases. As our understanding of the topic builds, we can begin to cluster together concepts and develop an understanding of what these con when these concepts occur in relation to the topics we are studying. By understanding concepts and when they occur in relationship to the phenomenon we are studying, we can restrict out those concepts that seem to be random or spurious, meaning those concepts that that don't seem to fit into any pattern that relates to our observed phenomenon. And finally, as we are writing our research report, we are continuing to use the constant comparative method. If you are using a grounded theory approach to your analysis and you're coming up to the deadline in your, in your thinking and you are thinking to yourself, oh no, I don't have the slightest idea of what is going on here, be not afraid. Oftentimes, during that report writing phase of grounded theory is the place where the final theory really comes together. Slide seven. Semiotics, or the science of the study of signs, is a qualitative analysis method in its own right. However, I think it really shines as a foundational understanding of the process of qualitative research and analysis. Every society constructs shared meanings for numerous symbols. So, for example, I, when I say there are 444 zebras in the meadow, I have produced an utterance that is full of constructed signs. The four numerals that consist of the symbols uh, or signs that we use to resent, represent 444 of something that was something that we use as a society, we as a society have created in order to help us articulate and understand frequencies or magnitudes, etc. The word zebra the, with the word meadow, those are constructions that we associate with a horse-like striped animal in the case of the former and a grassy area in the case of the latter. Those are simple signs. As we can see, from the table here, those words we have constructed as a representation of a phenomenon in the naturally occurring world have also developed other meanings based on the way people interact with them. A poinsettia, by its nature, has nothing at all to do with Christmas, but individuals who desire to make money on poinsettias have taken advantage of the pattern of associations of a poinsettia turning red in the deepest part of winter with the arrival of Christmas. So sometimes in semiotics, we associate nouns with nouns, such as poinsettias with Christmas. Sometimes we associate the saying such as number four, say cheese, which we use as a command telling someone that we want them to smile so that we can take their picture. 
And finally, we associate a saying like, break a leg with the acting profession, but it's meant as a form of mis wishing someone luck. Now thinking for a moment about cultural competence, for someone who has not been raised in a certain culture, some of these sem semiotics become difficult to understand. For example, my friend Bettina, who is from Vienna, sent me an email with some lovely pictures of her city with fireworks going off, wishing me guten Rutsch. Now, since this was at New Year's time, I assumed it was some sort of Germanic colloquialism, and sure enough, it was. I couldn't understand why she was wishing me to have a good slide. So I researched the saying and came to understand that and commented back to her about the, how appropriate it was that she sent me those pictures using PowerPoint, which puzzled her completely since she did not know that we in America colloquially call a PowerPoint presentation a slideshow. So when we're thinking semiotics, we need to be sure to think beyond words. When you are doing your research, be sure to take note of all the different meanings of all the different things that are going on in your research environment. Slide eight. Now, if you can't understand how qualitative research can build your skills as a clinical social worker from all of that we have talked about so far this semester, begin thinking about conversation analysis that should change that understanding. Conversation is a socially structured activity. That statement has a lot of layers to it. Notice how your mode of conversation changes depending on the social situation that you are in. If you have the same conversation with a group of people who are culturally like you, or share your gender, or perhaps your same age, or perhaps all of the above, then you will find that you communicate very differently than you would if the group were dramatically different from you. And since conversation is socially structured, the topic of our conversation will also vary from topic to topic within different social groups. So we must always understand the context that a conversation occurs in. Therefore, it's important to remember when analyzing, let's say, data from a focus group, that you, the researcher, have created a specific social context, and that must be understood for you to properly analyze the data. And finally, the third point, we need to understand conversation as it actually occurs. If you are transcribing conversations, that <clears throat> it is important to include the exact wording. And if people use contractions, don't correct them. And include all the various pauses and paraverbals that people make. Sometimes when I go back and listen to my podcast, I got to think that I would be a conversation analyst's worst nightmare. But it also gives me insight into the tentative nature by which we can ascribe meaning to some of these paraverbal utterances. Sometimes when I'm stressed, I stutter a little bit. Sometimes when I have my allergies acting up, my thinking is a little bit slower, and therefore the pauses are longer. And I've noticed times when I have a headache that I'll often have to correct myself. I wonder how the conversational analysis would think of some of those things. Oh, he can't make up his mind. Yes, I can't make up my mind because I have a headache and I have a hard time thinking of what I want to say. Slide nine. Although Ruben and Babby pointed out that qualitative data analysis is as much an art as it is a science, I would like to emphasize that there is a lot of science to it. And what I mean by that is there is a systematic way of approaching qualitative data analysis that makes your research much more reproducible, transferable, and it makes your audit trail much simpler to follow. The three main tools that someone uses are coding, memoing, and concept mapping. Before we go into discussing each one of 
those key tools individually, I think I would be remiss in my duties as your research instructor if I did not tell you what qualitative data analysis is not. Qualitative data analysis is not reading over a bunch of materials or observing a bunch of people interacting or listening to a bunch of interviews and then deciding through some mysterious process that goes on in your head and is only known to you what is the meaning of all your data. That said, those mysterious things that happen after we've been exposed to some data and we suddenly have an understanding of phenomena are an important part of qualitative analysis. And we will get to that when we talk about memoing. Slide 10. When we code data in qualitative analysis, what we are doing is going through a process of assigning some sort of a classification system to discrete pieces of data so that we will be able to retrieve and organize them later. <clears throat> the purpose of our coding procedures is to organize our discrete codes, which are freestanding chunks of data, into some sort of a related concept. While there are a lot of ways to approach coding, the two broad methods either are hypothesis-driven or open coding. Hypothesis-driven coding involves generating a series of codes a priori. That simply means that we have developed a list of codes prior to starting our research that we will be looking for after we have gathered our data. For example, when we look at the exit interviews of our students in this program, we will often look for certain areas to code data as. Maybe comments are related to curriculum, organization, diversity, or instruction, just to name a few. The other process that is often used in qualitative data analysis is to use open coding. What open coding is, is a process by which the analyst immerses herself or himself into the data and assigns codes to chunks of data in light of the context where the analyst is observing them. Say, for example, you are analyzing a stack of MSW student practice journals in order to understand the lived experience of students in their practicum. As you go through journals, you would read a sentence and assign a code to it. Say, one student said, I feel like I cannot tell anyone at my practicum about my sexual orientation. And <clears throat> might look something like, that might look something like, excuse me, and code, that code might look something like hiding true self. Or it could simply be hiding. One can also open code that as sexual orientation. A single piece of data could potentially be coded with one or more codes. Slide 11. I think I said earlier I would talk about those brilliant flashes of insight that we get when we become very familiar with a set of data. Now is that time. After we have been exposed to our data for quite a while, we often have insights. When we have such insights, we should write a memo about them. Memos are much like those things that you should have picked up at the grocery store but forgot when you were there. Sometimes they are thoughts that don't show up at the right moment. So you may be sleeping and have a dream about your research project, particularly if there's a deadline looming, or if you're analyzing material that is particularly disturbing or difficult to deal with. When we have such events, record them in some manner. Now there's other types of notes which are much more systematic and are part of the science of analysis. So for example, when you develop a code <clears throat> strictly for theoretical coding, you should write a note about that code. What this code is about and why you chose the term that you chose. Theater theoretical notes are those notes that we often write out of the blue when we suddenly have an insight um, about what our uh, research means. What is the important point of our research, or at least an important piece? 
and we can write this down as theoretical notes and they will help us during our report writing phase. And finally, there are operational notes. Operational notes may be simply about the process of doing the research and they may be important for writing up of the report or they may be important for audit trail reasons. Slide 12. Oftentimes, <clears throat> our concepts spontaneously emerge during the process of coding. Other times, we have to go through a more systematic process to organize individual codes into conceptual packages or containers. I use the word packages or containers since in the old days when we did qualitative coding and <clears throat> organized them into concepts. We would literally have our codes printed out on 3 by 5 cards and we would stack them together and then bundle them with rubber bands, let them sit for a day or so, revisit them and come up with some conceptual meaning about that bundle of codes. So you can see in the diagram in this slide that there are a number of different concepts that would have emerged from our qualitative coding and organizing process. And what it does is, is that it gives us a graphic demonstration of the relationship of our concepts one to another. And this is not just an intellectual process or something that looks cool on a slide. When you get these relationships organized, your concepts will drive your final report. And as we start to write our report based on these organized concepts, we can backtrack our way through our organized code system and pull out those interesting quotes and rich descriptive data that makes qualitative research reports so compelling. Slide 13. There are numerous qualitative data analysis programs out there for your computer. And you don't necessarily need to have a qualitative data analysis software program to complete your research projects. In fact, one of their main uses to me is that the qualitative data analysis software is a great way to keep your data organized, keep your codes organized, keep your memos organized. The qualitative software program that I use is called Atlas TI and they have a demonstration software that is available for download. It seems to be fully functional but is limited to analyzing 10 documents at a time. There's also some other restrictions on the number of codes one can put into it but it's pretty functional for us for a small student project. I will have links in our Blackboard site to where you can go check it out. Great thing is that Atlas TI works on both Windows and Apple computers. The program listed in the slide in Bebo works only on Windows computer and it does not have a free demonstration mode. There is also a qualitative data analysis software for Apple computers called TAMS Analyzer. The good news is it is free, and the not so good news is it's just a little hard to work with in my opinion. But to be fair, I have not given it an honest chance. But we could make a lot of good use in our qualitative analysis with our normal Office Suite software on our computers. It is possible to quote code qualitative text in Microsoft Office by using the note function and then we have the ability to print off those notes separately fairly easily. Further, there is also a way to export text from Microsoft Word text editors into an Excel spreadsheet or other type of spreadsheet. Then we would be able to do our coding and sorting of codes using the spreadsheet. Slide 14. I have some older recordings around that demonstrate doing some of these coding techniques using the Microsoft Office Suite. Plus I have an even older recording of me sorting codes into conceptual themes, old school, using 3x5 cards and rubber bands. We will be practicing coding in class, which is really the way one can learn that process. So that would be all for today.